Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Edric Show. This is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. I am your host, Edric Jerome. I want to thank you for tuning in. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and you will get access to all of this content each and every week. Very special guest today. I want to introduce actor, producer, and filmmaker, Mr. Ernest Harden Jr. Over his long and distinguished career, You've probably seen him in iconic shows like Hill Street Blues, The Parkers, The Steve Harvey Show, and The Jeffersons. In addition, he's appeared in many, many, many films, including White Men Can't Jump, the classic spy thriller Three Days of the Condor, and Sweetwater, which is currently streaming on Hulu and Amazon Prime. I'm honored to welcome to the show Mr. Ernest Harden Jr. Welcome to the show, man. Uh, my pleasure, man. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you know. no, you know, when I met you, and we'll get into that a little bit, uh, I told you I wanted to have a conversation with you, man. So thanks for coming on the Edric Show. No, I love it. I love it. All right. So let's get into it. Um, let's start at the beginning. So as a kid growing up in Detroit, uh, did you always want to be an actor or or when did you get the acting bug, man? You know, it's it's um, it sort of happened to me early on. And uh, I don't know, maybe the car, the stars were aligned, but uh I love sports. I love basketball, uh, like everybody uh, did in my neighborhood in Detroit. Uh, came up through um, kind of a rough neighborhood. Um, and one day in school, the teacher gave us a assignment to come back and read a, a, a part of the, of the uh, lesson book. And uh, so we all had a part of it to read, and we went back and I, I kind of looked at it my, and I started reading it and my father looked at me and said, no, 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 put emphasis behind everything, you know, uh, put some feeling into it. And so I said, okay, then we worked on it. And when I came back to class, everybody was reading and it was sort of a, a, a science slash, well, in Detroit, they had a lot of factories. So it was a, how to make automobiles and how to use the the lava that they create from the, the steel that they melt down and all of that. And I finally just, uh, and when it got to my turn, I stood up and I was, I was reading with, um, with feeling the property of matter, which remains in uniform motion has to be extracted upon by an external force. And um, the teacher said, what? read that again stop stop do that again and uh i did it again and then she brought in the principal hold on a second she brought in the principal she said this guy is uh good so they decided to kind of craft me toward theater from then on and so i started being any in all the plays even in um back as far as elementary school so it was sort of lying in the stars i went on to uh you know, to continue in high school, being talent shows and plays. And again, I love basketball, but, you know, at 5'10", I was kind of short for that. I had guys that were, <laughs> they could do what I could do. Uh, by far, they could, there was one friend who was my best friend uh, that we went to. I ended up going to Michigan State University after high school. And, uh and I played on the freshman team. And I was on the team with him. And he became, matter of fact, he was a little taller than I was. But he was the leading scorer in the Big Ten two years in a row that year, the, that two years. And his goal was, and he was just a ball of muscle, and his goal was to, he says, my goal is to sit my butt on the rim. <laughs> and uh, I looked at him and I said, wow, He's not too far from that. I think I better just concentrate on this theater. <laughs> and so I love them both. So, I, you know, I concentrated on theater and uh, and got a degree in theater at Michigan State and then um, kind of headed off to uh, New York to make my way. Um, at that point, you, of course, ultimately had to break into the business, as they say. Um, but the question I have for you is this. Um, Breaking into the business then is probably much different than breaking into the business now, right? 
Um, what are some of the differences maybe that that you had to experience that maybe folks breaking into the, the, the business now may not have to experience? Or what are some of the differences, ma'am? Well, we didn't have an internet, one. Um, you know, the anything you did, we didn't have cell phones or social media where you could you can post your stuff all over and somebody might see it because, you know, that's uh, social media. There's like a lot of people looking at you. And uh, if you have something good, sometimes people really get uh, uh, known for um, just having something good on uh, social media. So we didn't have anything like that. Uh, so everything I did, um, once I got to New York, I stayed with, uh, I had an uncle that lived there for, uh, and I stayed with him for a little while, but his his wife was saying, gosh, you know, two weeks, you haven't made it yet. Uh, you know, I said, well, I might need a little bit more time. She said, no, you need to go home. <laughs> So I didn't want to go home, so I just left that place and stayed with uh, friends. And, yeah, you know, I did the whole thing. I ended up uh, staying on a park bench for a little while. I mean, I really went through the gamut of, um, of, of, of being very difficult, the things that were super hard to do that maybe a lot of you wouldn't do. But it was my desire. My father always told me, and my father was, I was blessed to have educated parents. They were educated. Uh, my father went to Morehouse, and my mother went to Spelman. That's where they met and came to Detroit uh, to buy a house And after he did a stint in the Army. And um, that's where I was born. But he was, and my sister, she always gets mad with me that I don't enter. I don't uh, talk about her in my interviews, but she, she's actually started a family. She went on to, uh, she's very smart. She went on to get her PhD in music in Northwestern. So, and did some things like conduct the um, Chicago Symphony and also the Detroit Symphony. So she was, and she's uh, pretty heavy. But anyway, I, um, my father would, would um, in, in part knowledge, to us when we were growing up, saying, um, uh, quoting from um, Benjamin E. Mays, who was the um, head of of uh, Morehouse at the time, when, that he went when he was there. And he was saying that, you know, your desire needs to, to drive you by day and burn you at night. Hmm. In other words, you... It's burning you while you're asleep and then it's driving you by day. I never forgot that. And that's how I felt. And if you really want something, I think that's that's the answer. You just have to just focus and, and never give up. So I just, um, especially those times when I was on a park bench, I was in a new city, New York, didn't know anybody really. Uh, and I remember this one day, I felt so alone. I was sitting there, and uh, and I saw these couples walking around, holding hands, and everybody seemed to know each other and love each other and all of that. I, I felt I knew no one. I said, gosh, you know, this is rough. What could be worse? Lord, what could be worse? And then it started raining. <laughs> and I said, oh, my gosh. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it just, uh, like I said, my intestinal fortitude was there. Uh, I had one ticket to go back to Detroit, and I never used it. Matter of fact, I think I have it on my wall. And uh, and I just, I stuck it out. I actually, I got a break. I didn't have a place to go. And um, I had a girlfriend back in Michigan State. And her sister was a big star at the time, a woman named Denise Nicholas. Oh, yeah. Alice. Of course. Oh, you know her. Yeah. Of course. Well, I, I, I was going with her sister um, uh, back at Michigan State. We were in college together. Her younger sister. And what happened is just before college, we broke up. 
But just before I graduated college, I'm sorry, we broke up. But when I got to New York and everything, her mother had known that I was in New York and hadn't heard from me. I felt I was destitute, out, didn't have a place to go. I just called her just to say I was in town. She says, her name was uh, Louise Bergen. That was That's her mother's name. And she says, Ernest, you're, you're, I heard you're in town. Come over for dinner. Uh, you have time? And I said, uh, yeah, I think I can make time. <laughs> you squeeze it in. <laughs> I was there. I went there, and she was so gracious. I ended up staying with her for uh, at least six months. Wow. And uh, that gave me a place to stay. Uh, and it also, you know, enabled me to go and hustle auditions, which back in those days, um, you you would stand in line for hours waiting to, it was a cattle call, it was called cattle calls. And you had to stand in line for hours waiting for, uh, to get to see the people who were putting on the uh, shows and whatever, and uh, you get all the way up there after standing in line for hours with your pictures and, and your resume, and you get up there and, and they would take maybe, they would look at a line of us and say, okay, you, you, and you stay. Okay, everybody else, thank you. Yeah. You say, wait a minute, <laughs> I've been here for hours. Somebody's gonna see me, you know. But my hustle was that I got up every morning, they had a paper, called the um, Backstage. And uh, that was a trade paper. And if you get it early, maybe you could beat some of those people who would be there auditioning too. It was just, I mean, to go for show business, you just really have to, there are so many people going for it. It's a glamorous job if you get it. And so people from all over the world getting off the plane every day to try to compete against you and uh, for one role. And so I would get up early. The paper would come out at four. I'd be there at four grabbing uh, the paper right off the press. And I started going to my auditions, hustling agents. And then things started, started happening. I started getting in little plays. Um, and then I got a public television series uh, called Scoots Place, um, which was um, pretty nice. And then I finally got to meet Francis Ford Coppola in New York. And uh, I got a, a screen test to uh, screen for a movie called Apocalypse Now. And... Uh, I didn't get it, but we he put us on the plane, me and this other brother. His name is Lawrence Fishburne, who got the part. Mm. <laughs> but we were both on the plane together, you know, so I was that close. And uh, I decided to say, well, you know what? I'm coming back out here. I need more film of myself because I felt that I just wanted to actually just stay in New York and try to get roles in plays on Broadway, uh, you know, and uh, that was a goal. And I, I didn't want, I wanted significant roles on Broadway, not just in the background or something. And so I said, well, maybe if I get a little bit more film on myself, people will recognize me and then, you know, give me the better parts. But that was my plan. <clears throat> and uh, and I had already worked a few films back in New York. I My first film ever was called Three Days of the Condor with Robert Redford, which I didn't understand it was uh, would be such a classic, but I was really blessed to get in it and meet Robert Redford and the whole thing. And so that, uh, just even being in that film was positive. But when I finally moved back to L.A. after I got back from that audition, um, I got uh, a Coca-Cola commercial hmm. and then I got the Jeffersons. But I got the Jeffersons, the television show, the Jeffersons, which uh, was already a classic. It was my mom's favorite. And um, I got a guest, a guest star on it. And while we were filming, before it even came out, they liked the chemistry between 
uh, myself and Sherman Hensley who played George Jefferson. And it was, um, they called me that uh, before it came out and said, you know what, we think we want to give you a series, but we want to screen test you first and we're going to screen test you on air. Normally they take you, they screen test you and before you've seen by the public, but they gave me an on-air on air screen test and I said, oh, okay. So the character I played was Jason King, a character named Jason King. That was my first character on the Jeffersons. When, when all of a sudden I get into the producer's office ready to uh, read and, 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 and start working on the role of of Jason, I didn't see him in the script at all. So I'm looking and I said, gosh, well, you know, they started me off uh, small, but that's all right, I'm here. Or duh. <laughs> and so the producer was sitting, standing next to me. His name is Don Nichols. He's gone now. And he says, well, how do you like the script? And I was, oh, it's great. I mean, what am I going to tell him? Even if I didn't see anything in there for me, what am I going to tell him? Oh, no, I don't like this. You know, I said, well, no, it's great. He said, well, Marcus, you got a lot there. And, uh, you know, good luck to you. And we'll see. And, you know, if you if you do this, uh, you'll be on the show. If you don't, <laughs> you don't fall on your face because, you know, this is your screen test. And I'm like, Marcus, I looked at Marcus was on every page. Sometimes you got to be, you got to know what you asked for because you just might get it. <laughs> hey, to me, sleep was overrated. I went home and just, I think I studied that week. I don't even think I slept. I just studied, 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 put in that work and, um, and went through that rehearsal process of all these guys now that were my heroes, Marla Gibbs, Sherman Hemsley, Isabel Sanford, uh, Ned Weirmeyer, the doorman. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rock Roxy Roker. Roxy, Roxy Roker. Roker yeah. uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Bentley. Um, gosh, I'm losing it, you know. But he was, he was so gracious. Matter of fact, I didn't even have a car. When I was um, first starting that show, and he used to ride me to my house, you know. And uh, so I got through it, and the rest is history. Uh, they loved what they did. And matter of fact, I didn't know. I talked to the writers now. Um, uh, I'm friends with uh, Jay Moriarty, who wrote a lot of it. And he was saying, he said that they told him once I was on stage, uh, they said go right for him, and the show went from probably it was in the top thirty, but the show went from uh, maybe uh, sixteen to number one when I got on the show. I didn't know that, wow. but that character Marcus was was pretty popular. So Marcus Henderson is what the character was, and then from there <clears throat> things start to go well. I, I, I was becoming known. And uh, here's, I'll tell you a little story sure. about about fame because I wasn't used to it. I didn't know anything about, uh, you know, being famous. I don't know if that's my phone. But I had a, uh, I had a, uh, when we were filming these, these shows, they still hadn't aired yet. So... Uh, and then they start to air, and we had a break. They have something called hiatus, where you you leave, and they they film, but you can go home for Christmas break or something like that, and you come back. And so I I went to back to Detroit because you know that's where I was from, and yeah. get to see my you know spend the time with my uh, parents and uh, sister on Christmas. And we had a, a layover in Chicago. Uh, on the way back to Detroit. And the shows had just started to air. And I just wasn't aware of anything, but all of a sudden, when I got off the plane, they started, uh, all these people started 
running. And, you know, a brother's going to run. Of course. He's not, he's not going to wait there. And so I'm running. <laughs> I'm running. And then I look back, and, and I said, gosh, what are we running for? They said, slow down. We're running for you. We want your autograph. I What? <laughs> oh, oh, you do? I had no idea. I was just running. Everybody was running, and they were running toward me, so. I said, oh, okay. And that was my first experience with fame. It hit me like a ton of bricks, <laughs> but it was it was great, you know. And so, yeah, the Jeffersons, uh, once they started airing, you know, I started getting other stuff and kind of changed my life. Uh, I don't know. That's part of it in a nutshell. Sure, sure. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people don't know, or maybe, you know, if they haven't followed you, you were not only on the Jeffersons, you actually had an appearance on Good Times, right? I mean, then you you made an appearance on Good Times. Uh, am I am I correct in that? Yeah, I was. When I was on the Jeffersons, that, that's when I started getting a lot of the work from different places. But the thing is, I was signed for three years and I couldn't get out and do some of it. Uh, but uh, the Jeffersons and Good Times, they were all under that same umbrella of Norman Lear, one of his shows. So they agreed to let me do that Good Times. And it's so weird because I did one only Good Times, and I had a great time. It was a good time, you know. <laughs> great people. <laughs> I really had fun with Johnny Brown, all those people. And Esther Roll became like my mom, you know, away from home. And um, and the thing is, that show, it became so popular because so many people uh, know that I, I did that show. I just thought it was one show. It wouldn't make any difference. Over the years, they've been showing that like crazy, and, and evidently it's one of their most popular shows. Uh, Hal Williams played my father in it. Hal Williams, you might remember him uh, as Pri from Private Benjamin, the movie. And 227, right? And 227. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized, uh, you know, he was kind of like a little, he was a mentor. He was really cool. Uh, and uh, that show kind of became a classic. He still calls me son. What's up, son? <laughs> and so that, that was great. I had a great time over there. Um, <laughs> And and a matter of fact, I think I messed up. You know, Janet Janet Jackson was really uh she would see me at rehearsal and she seemed like she really liked me. But at the time, she was kind of young to me, and I was like, no, 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 no. And you know, and how did I I mean later on she became this big star. And I'm like, oh, you know, wow, <laughs> did I mess up? <laughs> sometimes you, sometimes you, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I tell you another two, another sure. little experience too. A little guy used to come to me every day and play his music, and uh, uh, and I would it would have a rock feel to it, and I said, oh man, yeah, that's great, man. I like that, you know. Uh, but I'm kind of a rhythm and blues man myself, you know, and and jazz. And he, but he would play his stuff, and I said, yeah, it's going to be good. And it was Roxy's son, little Lenny. Lenny Crap. Yeah, man. <laughs> he, became, he became huge. And so these, it was it was amazing, these, these people popping up all around me. And uh, really, the music world, they're really doing great things. So... <laughs> Uh, I I enjoyed that Jeffersons too. I they I didn't get a chance after I was off. I was mm, I was a little upset because I wanted them to bury me over there. I just loved being over there and working with them and all that. But I think that they had plans of um, uh, just moving on from the younger characters on the on the show and just focusing uh, the last few years around Isabel and uh, Sherman and um, so I did, that's when I started to really you know look for other 
work. And I started, uh, I got in a movie that I starred opposite Betty Davis. It was a movie called White Mama. At the time, we did it back in 1980. And uh, I'm the only black to ever star opposite her, as I have her as a leading lady. You know, uh, she was awesome. And it was a, but it was a TV movie. And, uh, and I wonder sometimes today, I was telling Denise, because we're still, Denise is my sister, Denise Nicholas. And I said, gosh, you know, every time I think about how, uh, blacks have broken through certain barriers in this business. Um, they talk about, oh, I was the first, I heard some people talking about, I was the first person to ever play a police uh, captain or a woman, the first time she did this or that. And I'm saying, well, you know, that, that part was so significant uh, because I was lead. I'm the only lead to ever star opposite Betty Davis. It wasn't a degrading role. It was, it was positive, powerful, uh, about two people who loved each other and as a um, and tried to help each other through, through their uh, ordeals. Uh, uh, she was a destitute widow, and I was a street kid, and we came together and formed a bond and, and made things happen and so i just don't understand why more people don't know about that film more people don't uh recognize it when i look at cnn and see uh okay we're going to talk about the the black experience in in film i said why isn't that not included so amazing and then when people find out wow you that was such a good movie wow I can't believe you you did that. Wow, I don't know about that. Why I didn't know about that. So I just wonder, maybe the forces that be said, no, you know, because we got a lot of, and I'm not, didn't finish my thought. Sure, sure. But why, maybe there was a, a you know, maybe it was her, her state or whatever, but you know, it's racist. And maybe uh, I know we got a lot of um, fan mail that was racist. Uh, and they used to read it to me on the way back from the set when we were finished filming. Um, and she, like one day, her and Jackie Cooper, who directed it, said, "Do we? You want to hear this, Ernest?" And I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm from Detroit. I heard everything. You know, it's nothing you could tell me. But you would. You would, they would read letters like, yeah, Betty Davis, yeah, I used to like you, but now you're, you're uh, starting in a movie with that N-word, that brother, that N-word, and so I'm not, uh, I'm never going to watch anything that you do again, you know, and I would, I was floored that they would tell somebody like Betty Davis, who was a, a legendary icon, this kind of stuff, racism is alive and well. You know, me being naive, thinking, okay, 1968, Martin Luther King kind of died for all of that. It's over. But no, it was live and well. This was uh, 1980. So I guess I guess I often wonder, did it have something to do with um, maybe keeping that movie? Because we won, we won awards, we won uh, hmm. Emmy. And maybe keeping that movie from really uh, getting out there and uh, the way it should have been <laughs> because of, uh, you know, so even though it was, uh, Betty Davis was iconic, probably was a force that didn't want people to know that she started opposite a black man. And, but she herself was that, radical. She was great. She wanted people to know. That's why she called that movie White Mama. It was called A House Is Not A Home or something like that at first. The book was uh, called that. But she wanted people to know hey, I'm starring with a black person. This is this movie's called White Mama. So that was her way of 
saying, whatever you feel about it, this is what it is. And I'm doing this movie with this this black man. So I, I admire her. She was great. <laughs> um, you, you've casually dropped some of the, the, the legends of Hollywood, Robert Redford and and Betty Davis and all of these, and you know, Sidney Pollack, who directed Three Days of the Condor, on and on and on. Have you ever found yourself in uh, or on a set where you were starstruck, where you were like, wow, you know, like that's Betty Davis? Or have you ever had that kind of experience with, with some of these great people? Yeah, I mean, if, um, yeah, yeah, I've worked with a, a lot of them. Uh, uh, Harrison Ford, um, I, but you know what? When you say starstruck, I don't know. I I don't say I I I am grateful to have worked with uh, these people. But when I'm on a set, I think my mind is focused on just being the best I can be. And I know I I just I think the fear comes in you or takes over and you say, well, hey, you know, I'm not thinking about them as uh, as a fan. I'm thinking about them as a person that uh, they're going to look at me and I'm going to go to bat and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to knock this ball out the park. And so it's not really, it's just one, I just want, because even the Jeffersons, if you think about it, that, that cast, period, was huge back then. That was like my mother's favorite show. And and it was uh, huge. So just to be around them and work with them and uh, every day, you had to just, that's part of show business. You just had to get your nerve together and, and, and believe in yourself and go for it. So I was at all, I met, I met a lot of people, I mean, I met a lot of people. I'm trying to think of all uh, Morgan Freeman, um, uh, uh, Jason Robards, uh, you name it. And, you know, I got to work with these people, and uh, I don't know. I was never. I don't think I was starstruck. I just wanted to. I felt if I was there, I'm uh, as good and comparable and. And I just wanted to do my job. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, perfect. No, no, no. You did. Perfect. Perfect answer. Um, let me ask you now, because uh, I met you last month at the uh, Peach Theater and Film Festival International uh, in Hollywood. And shout out to Pachanda Bois and her team uh, for putting together such an amazing festival and a, a collection of creative and talented writers and filmmakers. It was just an amazing experience. And I was you know, pleased to be a part of that. But like I said, that's how I met you. Um, but as you sit here now in 2023, can you speak to the opportunities that independent filmmakers have now to create and market and get films out there uh, without necessarily needing the traditional way of like maybe some of the bigger studios and this and that? Because there were some phenomenal films that we got to watch uh, mm -hmm. during that festival. So can you speak to that that change in how, how the filmmaking industry is now? Yeah, I mean, I think back when I was coming up, they didn't have the iPhone. They didn't have all these methods of uh, making film that was like not nearly as expensive as like going through and, and, and trying to uh, put a film together back in the day. So now these kids are coming up with a film made from an iPhone, a film with the quality that looks really good films coming up like a lot of those films i don't know um what their budget was but they were a lot less than what it would have been back in the day so these kids got these people have so much of uh it's it's a lot better opportunity to get your film out there the thing is distribution is always kind of difficult to try to get that because you got it you still need to have a lot of money to distribute and also to get it into or get it and and I think that they uh these independent people um they have a a network 
but it's hard to um, distribution is probably the hardest thing to do. I mean, you can get your film made. Um, that's always that's a plus. You get it made, but to get it distributed, we're doing a film. We did a film called Velvet Jesus, and I I starred in it. And that's the whole thing. They have these different services now, streaming and everything. But I'm, to get it into the theater and, and make it uh, get into a, a major theater across the country, so many theaters, it's still difficult because they have the, uh, these people have the distribution uh, chain kind of sewn up. And they've been at it for years. I mean, <clears throat> you can go to, for example, 20th Century Fox, but if you get on their little subsidiary uh, Fox Light pictures, if you can do that, yeah, you can get your film distributed. So that's just, I'm just saying that's the the difficulty, but to make these films, hey, it's just like anything. If it's quality and, uh, and people see that it's quality and they see potential that they're going to make money, because that's the bottom line, then you can get it through, and it's and that's that just comes with doing it and persistence. So I think these, I, I'm proud of those filmmakers that uh, I saw, including Peach Peach Andra, because she is uh, she's putting on that entire festival. I just thought that was that was amazing, and I met her. Matter of fact, I met her years ago when I was. Um, she wanted me to be involved in a, a play that she was doing and she was <clears throat> taking across the country. And uh, she was introduced to me by a, a, a friend uh, named Eric Chambers. And so I met her and I saw she was a young person trying to do something. And so I feel I'm always trying to help young brothers and sisters who are like coming up and but they they have to be serious and she was very serious about like trying to do a lot of things she had a lot of uh ideas and stuff that she implemented and she she did the theater we did the tour came back and then she she was also into film so we did a i did a film for her called bus stop great film by show. the way just let me interject that was an amazing movie I, I really enjoyed that film well thank you and and it's it's and she's got it like a streaming service now so it's it's on that for those who want to uh go see it but it's uh, it was a it was a short and it was her one of her first attempts actually i think her second attempt <clears throat> and i think somebody like that you can look and see that they're going to go far because the film quality was was awesome exactly. um, and 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 subject matter was was real and you know and and uh and and the performances were good and so i just i you know if you keep putting out quality people are going to notice your film was amazing thank you that, that yeah that you did and uh say the name of it again because blue eyeshadow uh with my production partner lamont and taj young blue eyeshadow <clears throat> And the star of it. Lamont Young. Yes. He was awesome. Your film was, uh, it was so moving. And I told uh, Lamont that if you, <laughs> that film can go somewhere that at least if it doesn't get out to the general public like to be in the theater, it really can um, uh, bring him some work, bring him some other work because, uh, and you as well, because I thought that was a quality, a really quality film. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. I was like, yeah, it was great. Thank so you. that's what I'm saying. People, the ones that are putting in the work, those are the ones that are going to make it, in my estimation. The ones that are serious about it and, and not trying to cut corners or shave and uh, this or that, but the ones that are really are serious about, well, I got to go through step one, step two, step three, step four, and are willing to do that, 
you're going to be happy at the end of your journey because it's going to happen. And that's how I always felt. <clears throat> I'm a member of a group called the Actor Studio. So I didn't move into uh, directing. I've directed a couple of things, but my focus was on just being the best actor I could be. So I got involved with this this group called the Actor Studio, started by uh, started by um, well people like Martin uh, Martin Landau ran it out here, and uh, Al Pacino runs it in New York. There are only two places. Even though you see that television show, uh, uh, interviews with the Actor Studio, I forgot the name of it on oh, Bravo. That's not part of us. They just use that name. There are two, you can, there are just two houses. And to be a part of the actor studio, all they do is focus on, on acting. They focus. Something went wrong. Please try again. There was a, they focus on, it's a gym for actors and we do scenes. And uh, it's enclosed. People, not everybody can see these scenes. But the people who are members could be people from Broadway, could be Dustin Hoffman is a member. You could He could be sitting up there watching your scene. Um, Robert De Niro is a member. Those are, these are the kind of people uh, um, that are members of the actor studio. And you go in there and you work on your craft. You do a scene and nothing is ever, when you finish the scene, even when you feel like, wow, that was powerful, that was great, they don't look at it like that. They say, yeah, that was a nice rehearsal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> keep going. And so some of these actors who are part of the actor studio feel they're the best actors in the world. A lot of them feel that. And I know that I felt pretty good getting in there because even in your audition, uh, you don't get in the first time. It took Dustin Hoffman six times, but it took me three. So I said, okay. <laughs> so, But that's the whole thing. So I wanted to be the best. My goal was just try to be the best actor I can be. Um, and I had a mentor. His name was, he's passed now. His name was Charlie Robinson, Charles Robinson. He was on um, Night oh, Court. Oh, Night Court. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, I've heard of <clears> him. <throat> That was, he was my he was my best friend and also he's the one that helped me get into the studio actor studio because he was a member member for years and and the people they know him from night court but they don't know he was one of our finest this guy was incredible and most of the stuff that he did was on stage um and um and so those that's where he did his best work and not everybody sees the plays you do, they're not as exposed as if you're on TV doing this line or that line. But he was a hell of an actor. And uh, I met another friend of mine, too. I just want to mention his name. His name is Dorian Harewood, the actor. He's the one that helped me get into uh, Get White Mama, the movie. They wanted him orig uh, originally. They wanted him to, because he had done something on Broadway or off Broadway with Betty Davis on stage, and uh, she liked him. And uh, but the the network the, for this particular character, he was he looked too old at the time, you know. And they thought, you know, because they wanted someone that looked like more like a teenager, and I <clears throat> had a young face at the time, and whatever. And so he suggested me. It was funny. He, when I had just done something called Buffalo Soldiers, it was a television movie with um, uh, Charlie Robinson was in it, uh, Stan Shaw, Philip Michael Thomas, uh, John Beck was, uh, you know, white actor who was, had a lead, and uh, Carl Lumley. These were some good people. I didn't, um, I was doing the Jeffersons at the time, but I was doing this um, this piece and uh, I, we were hoping that it would become a series for NBC. And uh, 
this was before Phil and Michael Thomas got Miami Vice. He was in there. And we were hoping this thing would go. And when it came out, I don't know what. They cut a lot of my stuff out. I did not know mm -hmm. they had my name up there. I told my, this was the first time I had ever experienced this. I told my parents. I told the people on the Jefferson set, Is Isabel Sanford, and she was like, well, I can't wait to see this. And it was cut out. I was cut out, basically. And I didn't understand why. Um, I just didn't understand why I was, I was hurt about that. So after that, Dorian came to my apartment, said, man, uh, I got something for you. Betty Davis wants to meet you. And I was like, don't play with me now, man. I'm depressed. <laughs> they cut me out. I can't believe it. Da -da -da. He said, I'm telling you, Ernest. Okay, all right. So I finally said, all right. He said, here's the address. You go over there. Da -da -da. It's all arranged. And that's how I went to that place. And she lived right there on a street called Havenhurst. And sunset. Well, I figured she would live, you know, at the hill somewhere. She would own half the hill. Right. But she had a, a pretty modest apartment with a doorman and a whole trip. It was, uh, and when I went up there, I was, I was in her apartment and there were like chalices of cigarettes all over. She smoked a lot, but they had BD on it, you know. Um, engraved on each chalice and we were um and i'm sitting up there and she said you know ernest i like you and we interviewed uh who should we get to direct us us uh of course us yes uh of course uh <laughs> you pick them betty no i'm betty no i'm just <laughs> and then uh so she came up with jackie cooper and I basically, that's how I got that movie. It wasn't an audition. It wasn't anything like that. Hmm. Uh, so my boy, Dorian, I'm forever grateful for him introducing me to her. And uh, she loved us both. We, we invited us to dinner and did that whole thing. Nice. But yeah, so I, I'm just telling you, you have to be serious. I later became a member of the studio and, and we're still there working. I, I go up over there. I have to do a scene on the 29th of January now. We're doing a, sh a, a play called Split Second. And uh, the scene, my scene partner, you've seen him on a lot of commercials. Matter of fact, he has one now. Um, that's um, He has one now that's out for State Farm. He just got it. I know it's new. And and uh, I, I congratulated him on it because I remember he went up for it and he said, man, you got to go up for these commercials. But he's kind of like a commercial face. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he, he so he got another one. So, I, you know, he's uh, he's really doing good. Uh, his name is uh, Bajir, Bajir Sullivan, Sullivan. So if you Google him, you'll, you'll see that he's... I will definitely look him up. I will definitely so we're, both, him. we're both doing this, this scene called uh, Split Second. And uh, it's, a, it's a powerful piece. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm oh, just no, no, no. We are... We got it's, it's not a problem. We have a couple of minutes left. I just want to ask now, uh, you know, actors are always working, always on the next project. You mentioned that you have something coming up with the actor Studio in, in January. But... Um, if people want more information about you or your career or your next project, where can they go to get information about Ernest Hardin Jr.? Well, I'll tell you what I, I, I have out now. I have a uh, film called Sweetwater. Um, it's about the first black basketball player to sign a contract in the NBA. Uh, it's a period piece done in the late 40s, 50s. Uh, this guy was a Harlem Globetrotter, and then they signed him to the New York Knicks. Uh, his name is Sweetwater Clifton. And so we did a movie through Warner Brothers. We did it. And I play his high school coach, which is an amazing story because um, he was my basketball coach in high school, too. He later on 
uh, he coached in Chicago because that's where uh, Sweetwater Clifton was and went to school. But years later, he came and coached our school in Detroit, Pershing High School, to a national champion, state championship with a guy named Spencer Haywood and another guy who became one of my best friends, Ralph Simpson, who was a 6'5 guard. Spencer Haywood ended up being a Hall of Famer, period, in the in the NBA. And and uh and uh and, and Ralph Simpson, uh he's not in the Hall of Fame, but he that particular game when we won the state championship, Ralph hit forty four points. So he could shoot shoot the ball, six five guard. Uh he was great. And uh Will Robinson is the coach's name. And he was iconic, especially in Michigan now. Uh, he did a lot of scouting, and he's the first black, I think, to coach NCAA, uh, NCAA program. I think it was in uh, Illinois State. Illinois State, I think. You know, Don't quote me, but I think sure. that he's the first black to ever do that. So he had a history in themselves. In, in in itself, and we were, and uh, McKean, uh, M- Martin Gui Gui, he's from um, Brazil. He was the director, and he said, "Man, the stars are aligned. Wow, that was we. This coach, and you, you knew him, and and, and was with him and worked with." I said, yeah, he, he used to whip my butt many times. And I said, I know him really well. <laughs> he had a little switch, he'd tear your little butt up. Did you go to class? Yes, sir, you did not. Wham, wham, wham. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is, he was, we just thought it was perfect that, you know, I would do that role. And uh, Richard Dreyfus is in it, uh, Eric Roberts, Jeremy Piven. Uh, we had a great cast. We, had, we have a great cast. It's called Sweetwater. It's on Hulu now. It was in the theater, kind of went out. They might bring it back, but it's on Hulu if you find it. It's on Hulu now. And, um, Excellent. Excellent. And, and so, yeah, so that, that, and then they find me just on social media. You know, I'm not really uh, great at all that, but I am on Instagram, Ernest Harden Jr. Um, on on Instagram and I'm on Facebook, uh, same name, Ernest Harden Jr. So you can find me that way. Hmm. Um, and, uh, that's it. Well, uh, I do want to say, uh, like I said, when I met you and you, you were so gracious and, uh, and, and it was funny cause we're sitting in the theater and I'm like, I look over and, uh, Lamont, like, you know who that is, right? <laughs> I was like, Oh man, that's so Shout out to Lamont Young, my, my production partner. But but I do want to thank you, Ernest, for coming on the Edric Show, for sharing your experience. Um, congratulations on your career. You've worked with some of the greatest actors of all time. Uh, you. You've held your own, and your body of work uh, speaks for itself. So I want to thank you again so much for coming on the Edric Show. I appreciate it. And uh, like I think again, I say your film was phenomenal. And uh, I hope to work with you. Yes, One sir. Day. Oh, we'll, we'll definitely we, we will be talking for sure. For sure. All right. For sure. All right. This has been another edition of the Edric Show. I am your host, Edric Jerome. As promised, this is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Ring that notification bell. You'll get notified when I post content each and every week. I want to thank you for tuning in and I will catch you on the next episode.